Welcome everyone. Kevin and I are back. Another episode of Financial 15, the show where we try to provide some financial insight, something you can use to help improve your finances. And we do all of that in 15 minutes or less. And today we're tackling a big topic. We're going to try to wrap up inflation, mm -hmm. a few key takeaways, all of that in 15 minutes or less. You want to stick around? Yeah, a topic we haven't talked about recently and probably in the last decade almost because it's been fairly substantially mute in any other way. But again, if you want to know about this topic or any of the other ones that we've done on our Financial 15 or back and forth, please visit our website at beckeror.com or go to our YouTube channel. We always look for more subscribers or like us on Facebook. We're ready for that. So we're going to start with inflation here, Clint. Now, this topic theoretically in 15 minutes hard to do. You could take days describing a lot of the stuff in there. But let's give that quick summary for everybody. What is inflation? What are we talking about? Yeah, we'll start with a highline definition here. And there's a couple of ways you can look at it. Uh, the two common ways you can look at it as a decline in purchasing power. So you had 100 bucks, you walked in the grocery store 10 years ago, you walk in today, that $100, you're not going to get as much produce as you used to get. There's a decline in your purchasing power. Or the other way to view that same topic is that prices went up. Kind of yep. a general increase in the level of prices in the economy. Often it's expressed as a percentage, they might say inflation is 2%, 3%, but mm -hmm. that's the idea, the decline in purchasing power or the increase in prices over time. There's a great infographic here from Investopedia, uh, and it shows you exactly that, inflation of a cup of coffee over time. This is U.S. data starting from 1970 at a quarter, quarter per cup, all the way to uh, recently at a buck 59. So that's inflation right there for you, Kevin, <laughs> increase in the price of coffee. Yeah, well, that, that's definitely something here. I mean, we must express that this is talking about probably a Tim Hortons. We're not talking about a, a Starbucks <laughs> coffee here by any stretch. I don't no know that it's when you get here a quarter. <laughs> exactly. But I mean, if we look at that, that's a 50-year time span, and that's about 650% of an increase in that time frame. So you can tell that inflation does have a very big effect on your purchasing power and things that you're going to have going forward. Because, you know, a cup of coffee at a quarter today, everybody would be lining up. But at a buck sixty, it's not quite the same situation, is it? Yeah, different story, different story. And that's the idea, right? Decline mm -hmm. in the purchase power, increased level of prices, kind of two sides of the same coin there. And we'll go through a couple of pieces here. We'll start about what causes inflation. Why are these prices going up? And, and there's a few, again, high level here. We're not getting into the nitty gritty, but a few high level causes for inflation. Often they'll say it could be a demand pull. It could be cost push. It can be a built-in kind of wage price cycle. And often you get you know, a, a bit of all of them. They're not exactly uh, concrete, distinct categories. You can have no. uh, a bit of both going on at the same time. But we'll walk you through a few of the details here. Why don't you start, Kevin, with uh, demand yeah. pull inflation? What's that all yeah. about? The demand pull inflation is basically that, you know, there's too few customer or, or there's too many customers chasing, chasing too few goods. I guess that's probably the easiest way to put it. So what you're getting here is that uh, with the increased supply and money, stimulated economy, demand for goods, services, it's all going faster than what the com production capacity could be. Theoretically, some of what we've got right now is that because of supply constraints. So, I mean, everybody's talking right now about that Christmas season. Well, if we're dealing with the Christmas season, there may not be as many of the goods that you want for Christmas. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to have an excess supply, you're going to find that those costs are going to go up because it's a special item. You can get it from there. So that's sort of the demand pull in a nutshell. But what's the cost push have to do with it? Yeah, a cost push a little different. The idea is that the inputs that go into the finished product, those inputs increase in price. You can see there the graphic there. There's got a helium. The price of helium goes up, so the helium balloons suddenly cost mm -hmm. more. Same concept there. And one folks often refer to as an example is commodities. Think of when gas prices go up, well, transportation in general is going to cost more now because it costs more yeah. to fill up the truck or fill up the airplane or whatever the transportation vehicle is. So any goods and services that rely heavily on transportation are going to cost more because gas prices and transportation went up. So the, the inputs go up, the final product increases as well. The last one there, Kevin, uh, more to do with expectations, but the idea yes. is those expectations can become reality when it comes uh, to prices and specifically when it comes to wages. Yeah, and that's the biggest one that you'd probably look at. As prices go up, everybody says, well, I, I need to be able to compensate so that I can afford to buy things that I used to beforehand. So if I'm working at a certain place and I'm negotiating my next contract for my employment, if costs have gone up by 5%, I'm going to have to have some sort of a rise in my price. Otherwise, I can't live the same way I'm living now. So theoretically, it works its way through that system. So wages will increase, 
as uh, you find that the prices of demand of goods increase as well. So the compensation is sort of respective to what the inflation numbers are going to be coming around at that point in time. So it, it all goes hand in hand together if we want to put it that way. Yeah, it's a bit of a cycle there too, right? If people realize, yeah. oh, this inflation is not temporary, it's sticking around, the expectations is going to be here for a while. Well, I need higher wages to compensate for that. So eventually they negotiate higher wages and then companies have higher prices <laughs> to compensate yeah, for the exactly. higher wages. They're, they're, they're paying their employees. So you get a bit of a cycle. Uh, the wage price cycle can uh, certainly happen. And uh, well, high level, we, we talked about what causes inflation. Now this is going to be key because I uh, try to bring it into people's everyday lives. They're watching TV and suddenly, hey, inflation is 2% or 3%. What exactly are they talking about there, Kevin? How do we actually measure inflation here in Canada? So when you hear a news story and they say inflation is 3%, what are they talking about? <laughs> well, they're, they're talking about basically what the, 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 the consumer price index is. That's usually the biggest one that we're dealing with. And that is a measure. It changes it changes in prices that are experienced by the consumer by the Canadian consumer as measured over a time frame and through a cost fixed good of baskets. So they take a specific eight major categories that they put it into. They take the prices on those. How have they changed over that time frame? And then they put that all together and they give it sort of a, a, a percentage return number that you can figure out exactly how it is. Mm -hmm. So prices mm -hmm. have gone up by 2% on these eight major categories. We know exactly what's going on for the inflation side of things. That is a cost, as we said, a cost of fixed basket of goods and services, not just, okay, we're picking one today, we're picking something else. And again, as we yeah. say, it can vary based on geographic scenarios, provinces, territories, or even select cities. The one that we typically use is the Canadian CPI that measures sort of across Canada, but each region has its own scenarios, doesn't it? It does. It does. Uh, you, you can get inflation for the province of Manitoba. You can get inflation for mm -hmm. some of the major cities. For example, the, the city of Vancouver might do their own inflation number. Uh, but the idea is they take a fixed basket of goods, like you said, and they just track it over time to see how that price will change for that basket of goods. But what's in that basket? That's kind of a key item that people want to know. And they break it into eight categories here. What you can see on the screen is from Statistics Canada. It looks at the, those eight categories, compares the August 2021 numbers to the July 2021 numbers. This is the most recent data uh, as we're recording this. And you can see the eight categories. They have food, they have shelter, they have household operations, furnishings and equipment, clothing and footwear, transportation, health, personal care, recreation, and then uh, the long category there for all your, your SIN products, the alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis. So eight categories, mm -hmm. and there are hundreds of little elements inside of those categories. Jeez. So it is an expansive list. It is a big bucket. Uh, so you see the headline number here, the headline, the all items inflation, and then each and every category. That's the basket that they track, and that's what determines the inflation is how each of those elements change over time. So let's dive into that, Kevin. Uh, what actually goes into CPI? Well, yeah, as, as you mentioned, it was a hundreds of different little elements that we've gotten. As we saw in that last graph that you had out there, I mean, the two biggest ones that have been increased over the last little while has been shelter and transportation. If you notice, right. the price of oil has gone way up, as has gasoline, and so is the housing prices. So it all makes sense that your CPI number is going to go up with that. But again, we're dealing with this. It is not an equally weighted scenario. That's one thing that we might, must mention. It may be eight categories, but it's not each category is weighted the same sort of way. So you have to know that certain ones have higher expectations for it and other ones are lower. Now, this basket content, again, is updated every four years and the category weightings are updated every two years. So mm -hmm. you may change a few of the hundreds of items in, in a specific category every two years just based on what's new, what's not new, things along those lines. But again, it, it's all going into making up what the elements are that we deal with for the CPI. And as you've mentioned before, it's hundreds of different areas in each specific category in those eight categories. Yeah. And the goal there is they're trying to get a reflection of what the average Canadian spends. Really different spending patterns. They're trying to find some mm -hmm. kind of average. And they do a household survey, the survey of household spending every two years. And that's what they're using to help update the weightings and update the content of that basket. I mean, a, a key item. We looked at that last category on the prior graph at category eight there, recreational yeah. cannabis, that wasn't even an item until 2016. <laughs> so That's right. That was an update they had to make in the basket to uh, make sure they're tracking the products correctly. But you get this idea of a basket of goods, the regular updating to make sure it reflects the average spending of Canadians. And that's how you get your inflation. But unfortunately, it's not simple that you get one number and that's it. There's always a, no. a battery of numbers when you have this kind of data. You have the headline inflation, Kevin. That's the one you'll probably hear on the news. It says up 2%. That's probably your headline number. But then there's this whole concept of core inflation. What's that about? 
Yeah, I mean, that basically, that's where everybody's got to take a look at it. You get the headline inflation, which basically categorizes everything, but then there's core. And core inflation, basically, they want to take the elements that they think are the most volatile, and they want to get them out of there because they're readjusting things. It's not a it's not a true sense of how overall inflation is. Mm -hmm. So as we've seen in the previous charts, transportation and shelter, they have some huge increases to cause headline inflation to go up. But is that true of core inflation? Is everything else moving it the same way? So no, if that's not the case, then if we take out the big plays, then we're going to get more of an underlying view as to how real inflation is moving minus two or three different items. That's sort yeah. of the concept of what core would overall be. Yeah, that's exactly. They're trying to get an idea of the underlying trend. So they take out some mm -hmm. of the really volatile items to get an idea of the trend. How they do that has changed. We won't go through all the details yes. here, but in the U.S., essentially what they did is they just kicked out the food and the energy category. So those are too volatile. So the core yeah, they're not volatile at all. Yeah, in Canada, a different measure up until 2016, they actually went line by line. They, they, those hundreds of little elements, they went through all of them and they kicked out the eight most volatile. So they'd say, all right, fruits, you're out. Gasoline, you're out. They'd go through them one by one. They don't yeah. do that anymore. Now the Bank of Canada has three different core inflation measures called CPI trim, CPI median, and CPI common. We won't go through the mathematics there, but the concept of inflation rates, unfortunately now, Statistics Canada tracks that big basket. They produce the results. You actually end up with four inflation rates, the headline, and then three of these <laughs> core three. inflation rates, just to make yep. things confusing. But the mandate, if you're going to have a key takeaway here, the Bank of Canada does have a mandate to keep that headline number between 1% and 3%. That's part of their goal of monetary policy, to target the 2% and try to keep it in the long run between 1% and 3 And we don't really talk about this because until recently, no. it's never even been above 3%. <laughs> It's been forever. I mean, you can go back to at least before the Great Recession in 2007, 2008, before you even worried about some of what was going on with these numbers. They've managed to do a very good job over that time frame, keeping it within there. So wages and everything else have maintained themselves. Mm -hmm. And it, it's been a good scenario. But now we're starting to see inflation numbers that have been come up. It's been a hot topic in the last little while, hasn't it? Oh, it has. It certainly has. And rightfully so. Inflation number has started to, uh, to rise. So a, a reminder here, you have the, the headline number which is the main one that gets calculated that look, looks at the total value of that CPI, that consumer price index. You get a couple of measures of core inflation that the Bank of Canada uses. But why does all this matter, Kevin? Well, all this data, if someone hears the news and they say inflation is 3% or 4%, why would that be important to them? Well, it's important because it dictates exactly what your purchasing power is going to be going forward. I mean, if mm -hmm. you have purchasing power or inflation that's going up five, six, eight, ten percent, your prices are going to escalate by the same way. If you don't have the same sort of wages to compete, it'll decide what can you buy and what can't you. Were you going out for dinner, you know, once a week and all of a sudden now the prices at the restaurants have increased? Well, maybe I'm not going to go up or those that are driving out to the lake all the time. Well, if gas is sitting there at a dollar a liter, that's one thing. At a dollar fifty a liter, now it's substantially more. Your costs in per, are, are impacted for how often I'm going to drive out or am I going to speed up the boat? So it, it has a huge effect as to what's going on. And as I said, they've managed to keep that fairly stable for now. But what we're seeing here is inflation is infecting these sort of things. But that's not the only one, is it? Yeah, there's a couple. And just to, to bring that home for a retiree or if you're doing a financial plan, that's going to yep. be key. You have to plan for some level of inflation to make sure you can compensate when those prices start to rise. And then the other part of that that I think people want to keep in mind is when you have high inflation, normally interest rates follow. We yep. talked about the Bank of Canada being able to keep inflation in that 1% to 3% zone for so long. Well, how they did that is by managing interest rates, moving them up or down accordingly to make sure inflation was in check. So if you have a high level of inflation, it's going to likely influence interest rates and you're going to see rates rise. So if you're thinking uh, if you got lots of debt on the books, well, that might be a problem. So two key items of how it can impact someone in the day to day life, your purchasing power and keeping in mind inflation certainly can influence the overall level of interest rates in the economy. Yeah, and that basically at the end of the day on your interest rate point is very important because as interest rates go up, less and less people are going to buy. If you get a 6% rate of return, maybe you'll put that money in and invest it as opposed to spending it. That way you start to hold the inflation where it is and things don't continue to creep up. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. there's a ton of things that we haven't even touched base on with whether it's <laughs> transitory inflation. Is this real? I mean, we could go on and on forever. But again, if you have questions on inflation in specific or anything else, please make sure that you visit us. Go to chat with Clinton and Kevin com. We are more than happy to answer any of the questions you come across on inflation or anything else you can think of. And again, this is sort of just a roundabout introduction to what inflation is. We could go on and on, but again, specific questions may come. Other than that, is there anything else you want to add, Clint? 
I think that was a good introduction to inflation. We'll be back again uh, with more videos quite soon. Take care.